All right, so welcome everybody to chapter nine of The Effect, uh, which is Finding Front Doors. Um, I apologize in advance. I had a really busy day at work yesterday trying to figure out or trying to finish prepare or one step of preparing some samples. So um, I didn't quite have enough time to actually finish making a presentation. So we're gonna, it's gonna be a little bit janky. Um, but hopefully it will still be informative and useful for everybody. So yeah, as I said, we're going to be doing chapter nine, finding front doors, and it'd be great if my keyboard would work. There we go. So what we're going to do is we're going to learn how to find front doors and DAGs. And basically this consists of two different things, defining and identifying natural experiments and learning about the, uh, aptly named front door method. So closing all of the back doors, which is what we talked about in chapter eight, is a very daunting task, especially when you've got a very uh, large DAG with lots of variables on it. Um, what is especially problematic is that sometimes you don't actually have the ability to close down all the back doors. Sometimes you can, but there may be variables that you have to control for in a back door, but can't maybe because you already have a data set and they aren't in your data or because they're sort of nebulous unknown variables that you just physically cannot control for, or you can't measure. And this is where finding front doors comes in. So there's two ways to find front doors. The first is to find a setting where some of the variation has no back doors or has only a few back doors that you can readily close. These are something that we would call a natural experiment. And the second way is to estimate individual components of a front door path. So individual arrows, even if the overall effect of treatment on outcome isn't identified. And this is what the author calls the front door method. So first thing uh, he talks about is isolating parts of a DAG with no back doors. And this is where we want to focus on a part of the variation in our sample that isn't driven by back doors, or as I mentioned before, is only driven by a few back doors that are easily controlled by. This can be done in two ways. This can be done by either being very judicious in which sample we select or using certain statistical adjustments, which we do not get into in this chapter and we'll discuss in the second half of the book. In order to think about um, how we want to do this isolation of a particular part of a DAG, uh, the author introduces us to randomized controlled experiment and there are randomized controlled experiments and this is the cleanest approach to isolating a path with no back doors. Um, in this approach essentially what happens is a researcher is actually stepping in and directly controlling who gets the treatment and who doesn't. Uh, this is ideally done with randomization, hence the name randomized controlled experiments. And when you do this with randomization, you're essentially ensuring that all of the variation in any of the backdoor variables that might be interfering in the relationship between your treatment and outcome are going to be unrelated to whether they got the treatment or not. So by introducing randomization, you're essentially saying, it doesn't matter what your age, gender, weight, whatever is, I just threw a bunch of numbers in a pot and used an RNG and got out whether you got the treatment. This is a very easy way to close all the back doors, but unfortunately explicit randomization isn't always feasible. Um, so we can't always do randomized controlled experiments. Um, and you know, an example of this, um, from my own research is, uh, I mean, I know this book focuses on social sciences, but I work in the field of paleontology where everything already happened and you can't take a dinosaur and 
do a treatment to it because the dinosaurs are all very, very, very dead. So we have to use uh, a lot of other methods in order to get at some of these questions. All right, so this is where my presentation actually ends and where we're gonna get a little bit creative. So in that sort of introduction to randomized controlled experiments, um, the author talks about the lottery system uh, towards charter schools in the United States, which is basically where you have a DAG that looks like this, where you've got your uh, treatment of interest, your whether or not a student goes to a charter and whether they have greater student achievement or worse student achievement. And you've got a whole mess of confounding variables here. So ideally you wanna identify a front door here um, that isn't affected by all kinds of stuff. And conveniently, there is a lottery system used by a lot of these charter schools to allow students who wouldn't otherwise be able to attend one to actually get into one. And he introduces this in the randomized controlled um, experiment section, but then later reveals that it's actually just a, it's basically just a natural experiment. Um, so I think it's sort of convenient to just say, we've got this example, this is a natural experiment. Why is it a natural experiment? So let's talk about natural experiments. Basically a natural experiment is any real world setting in which some sort of randomization has actually been done for us. So instead of having a researcher going in, rolling a pair of dice and saying, okay, persons one through 10 get the treatment and persons 11 through 20 do not, you go out into the real world and you find a data set where some of these variables have happened and sometimes they haven't and hopefully everything has happened more or less randomly. So we can think about natural experiments by sort of looking at our idealized randomized controlled experiment, what makes them work and how can we find this in the natural world. Basically a randomized controlled experiment works because they fix some of the variation in treatment to have no backdoors. So as long as we can have no backdoors in some way in the natural world, we have a working natural experiment. So we call any sort of variation that has no, or any sort of variation in treatment that has no open backdoors, a source of exogenous variation, which is a very fun and, I don't know, exogenous is a good word. Um, so basically this is any path that we can walk from the source of exogenous variation to the outcome that is closed or contains our treatment. So we can use plenty of things as sources of exogenous variation, even if they're not purely random, as long as they are as close to random as they can possibly be in the context of our DAG or data generating process. So as an example, we've got a causal diagram for um, a natural experiment here. We've got our treatment on the left and we've got our outcome on the right. And once again, we have a big smorgasbord of confounding variables. What's great is once we add this sort of natural randomness or natural pseudo randomness, um, we can therefore draw a front path directly from that natural variation or natural randomness to the treatment, to the outcome, and bypass all of this sort of messy business in the all kinds of stuff variable. Of course, there are some very important to consider differences between randomized controlled experiments and naturalized or and natural experiments. Sometimes there are going to be backdoors from the natural randomness to the outcome. This doesn't happen with pure randomization because we're very careful to make sure that it doesn't happen. 
But as long as we can control for something to shut that back door down, assuming that we've identified it, we're okay. Um, this process is the same as when we're identifying the effect of our treatment by controlling for things. And we're just picking a variable where the back doors are easier to control for than one where they're difficult or impossible to control for. Natural experiments, as the name suggests, are more natural. <laughs> so often, uh, if you're doing a study on people, excuse me, can you not play while I'm talking? <laughs> <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> So generally with a natural experiment, if you're working on people, uh, people don't even realize that they're part of an experiment. I mean, if you're working on plants or animals, even if you are doing a randomized control experiment, likely they don't know that they're part of an experiment either. Um, what's really cool about this is that the observations are actually likely to be more realistic in a natural experiment. Um, we have a um, a thing that we talk about in biology, which is you can have statistical significance, but do you have biological significance? So an issue with um, these sort of randomized controlled experiments is that you are controlling everything and that's great and that gives you a lot of very important data, but if you're introducing situations that would never happen in the real world, are you actually identifying something that would impact the way the system that you're interested in actually works? Are you actually getting a true signal or are you just like experimenting for the fun of it basically? Another nice thing about natural experiments is that sample sizes tend to be bigger because you're not having to go out and recruit um, uh, volunteers, you're also not going to be getting a subsample of the general population of people who just like to volunteer for stuff. So what this all means is that we're seeing the effect, um, or sort of on the flip side, you're not getting people who are, you know, just volunteer types, but you're also only seeing the effect on people or individuals who are sensitive to the natural randomness that you've chosen as your um, natural experiment. So if the effect would be different among another group of people, we won't see it for them. Uh, an example of this would be in that sort of um, lottery winning and charter school example. If there are variations among the population that has to go through a lottery versus the population that doesn't, you're not going to be capturing that variation because you're only looking at people who have um, gone into the lottery system. The fourth sort of difference between um, natural experiments and controlled randomized experiments is a matter of believability and I guess selling your research. <laughs> uh, people believe it. The, exo the exogeneity of pure randomization is valid and a good way to do things. So there is a lot more, there's a lot more convincing that you have to do when you're relying on an actual experiment in order to justify that your assumptions are correct, that your not perfectly random source of variation is um, random enough to be valid. Um, and essentially all that means is that you just have to be a little bit more deliberate in the way you're justifying your choices with utilizing a natural experiment to try to answer a causal question. So the author then has a section that basically goes through three examples of where um, that believability and that sort of justification of your assumptions um, may or may not work. So we've got three different studies here. We've got a study that looked on the effect of winning the lottery on declaring bankruptcy. Um, and basically here you've got a sample of 
people who all participated in the lottery and whether they won small amounts or large amounts, how does that affect their um, declaring bankruptcies? So here is our data. We've got a probability of, of bankruptcy relative to annual average on the y-axis and the years after or before or after winning the lottery on the x-axis. The, or the vertical rule here in the middle is uh, zero, so that's when they actually won the lottery. And basically what we can see here is for the people who won small amounts, there's very little difference in their probability of declaring bankruptcy before and after um, winning the lottery, whereas with the folks who won large amounts, which is um, anywhere between fifty dollars and $150,000, um, this is sort of misleading because it makes it seem like they only won fifty dollars, but <laughs> it's <laughs> it's fifty thousand to one hundred and fifty thousand. Um, what's really interesting is that they found that there was a drop in their um, their likelihood of declaring bankruptcy shortly after they won the lottery, and then an increase um, about two and a half years, two years after. So this is a pretty good example of where things are pretty believable. You've got, you know, every, your sample comes from um, a single source. You've got people who participated in the lottery and you've got this sort of natural division between people who want a small enough amount that it's probably not making a big difference in their sort of day-to-day -day financial decisions versus people who want a large enough amount that it is probably impacting their financial decisions. Our next example um, is one that is a little bit more abstract and it's looking at pollution um, in Beijing and whether people um, drive more on days where pollution is bad. And in order to control for a bunch of the back doors, they had a really interesting idea, which is looking at wind direction as essentially their, um, their natural experiment. So basically we've got this whole mess of information we're interested in, whether pollution leads to more driving. And as we can see, there's a whole bunch of different variables, well, three different variables on this particular DAG that can cause both pollution and driving and are therefore confounding variables. So the authors essentially say, all right, let's look at wind direction, it goes directly to pollution, which goes directly to driving. And um, they essentially found that wind control, when looking at particular wind directions, i.e. when the wind was blowing pollution towards Beijing, um, higher degrees of pollution caused slightly more driving. I think it was about 3%. Um, but the issue here is that there may still be backdoors. And we've isolated this here as U1. So maybe the direction of the wind changes with the season. Um, the season is probably related to pollution and driving. So all of this is good, but here's where we find it a little bit more, you need a little bit more justification to say, are we certain that we've properly laid out all of the back doors in this diagram here? Are we missing anything? And if we're missing something important like this U1 up here, the solution of using the wind direction might not be as robust. So I haven't read the original paper. I don't know. Um, but the authors do, or this chapter does note that they do actually control for season and weather as well, just to sort of get ahead of that potential issue. Then we have a third study um, which looked at the effect of uncompensated care, so medical care given by hospitals that they don't end up being paid for on patient experience. And what they use as their sort of natural experiment is um, 
the 2014 Medicaid expansion in the United States. And this is where some states, but not others, expanded access to the Medicaid program. And the assumption here is that with the expansion of Medicaid, those hospitals will get increased health insurance coverage um, that they might not have received otherwise and therefore should be getting fewer uncompensated costs. At least that's my understanding of this. I do not live in the US, so <laughs> um, this one was a little bit harder for me to follow because I, I this example was a little bit harder for me to follow because I, I just like, don't fully understand the Medicaid system. <laughs> Um, yeah, and... I, I think your understanding is, is right there. I mean, uh, you know, I think it's uh, certainly not for profit or nonprofit hospitals have to um, accept patients, even if they don't have the means to pay. Okay. Right. And so um, having Medicaid would ensure that the hospital would be paid at least something. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So they use um, Medicaid as their source of exogenous variation. And they find that reductions in uncompensated care uh, did improve patient experience, but only by a little bit. And the question here is, Kittens, hey, I don't know why you're doing this right now. <laughs> um, so the question here is, does this work as a source of exogenous variation? Um, States don't accept or reject Medicaid at random. There is huge politicization of Medicaid in the U.S. Um, and that is drawn very, very much along party lines. I mean, I guess in the States, that's sort of if it's politicized, it's it's drawn along party lines because you guys only really have two parties. Um, so states with different kinds of governments were probably more or less likely to expand Medicaid and states with different kinds of governments may also have um, sort of different standards of care or different regulations that would impact how their hospitals deal with uncompensated care or how their hospitals deal with uh, patient experience, things like that. So this is an example where um, again, I've not read the paper. I don't know how well the authors justified this, but you can see a lot more potential issues interfering with your choice of uh, natural exogenous variation. And there's probably a lot more justification that has to go into um, basically whether the results that you find are actually valid and are actually getting at the question that you want to answer. So isolating front paths is always feasible, um, just like you can always close back doors. But the further away you get from pure randomization, the further away you get from that sort of idealized, randomized, controlled experiment, the more things you have to control for, the more assumptions you have to make, and the more work you have to do in convincing people that your assumptions are actually believable. And sometimes the further away you get from that pure randomization, the unfortunate fact of the matter is, is that you are not going to get to that. Day. The fact is that you're not going to get to that believable assumption. Sometimes this method of using natural experiments is just not going to work. So yeah, and going back to that that Medicaid expansion example, that that one was was tough for me. Uh, just you know, again, I haven't read the study either, but just believing that that we're really getting to that front door and controlling for all the back doors. I mean, there was mention in that study that that they were controlling for some um, local and state level uh, variables, right? Maybe the political environment or something like that. But yeah, I feel like that one. There, there's just just like almost any other um, so, like social science experiment, there are just so many back doors that it just seems unlikely that they were, would really be able to close for all those, given that that, that yeah. really wasn't a random, uh, a random phenomena, phenomenon. That yeah, was I think healthcare is particularly tricky because um, you have like uncompensated care, but you also have, you know, level of funding of that particular 
the hospital outside of that uncompensated care and um, politics, which they talked about. Um, I'm sure there's like socioeconomic variables there as well, although that probably ties into level of funding of the hospital. Um, but yeah, I also had, um, as not a social scientist, that study would be the one where I would have the most questions about, mm -hmm. for sure. So we wrap up the chapter by getting into um, the second method that we talked about sort of at the beginning, which is the very um, aptly named front door method. Um, and while this is very cool and we're like, whoa, there's a front door method, let's use it. It only works in really specialized scenarios. Um, so basically the way the front door method works is you've got a causal diagram that looks something like here in figure 9.6. You've got a treatment, you've got your outcome, there is some variable m that is mediating your treatment and outcome variable and then you've got some variable w um, that is a compounding variable and causes your treatment and outcome um therefore this is <laughs> um, a bad path and or the path that goes along w is a bad path Unfortunately, in this scenario, W can't be measured. So we can't control for it. So normally we'd be at a little bit of a loss here. How can we sort of close this path if we can't measure W? Um, this, the solution is basically to isolate our front door path into different segments. So what we can do is we can measure the effect of M on outcome, and we can sort of separately measure the effect of treatment on M. Once you have those two effects, you can sort of magically combine them, and you've sort of successfully measured two components of this that are not really being impacted by W and get your a fun answer. So you can identify both treatment to M and M to outcome, combine them. There is a classic example that is used when discussing this method, and this is smoking. So we've got a causal diagram here where we've got smoking um, as our treatment variable of interest and the presence or development of cancer as our outcome variable of interest. Whether or not a person smokes or gets cancer are both caused by a ton, ton of different things. But we also have this sort of example here where smoking causes an increase in tar in lungs and having more tar in your lungs causes more cancer. So what we can do here is what we can't control for lots of things, we can measure the impact of smoking on the amount of tar in your lungs, and we can also separately measure the amount or the impact of the amount of tar in your lungs on cancer. So the example we have here is let's say that smoking causes, or an additional cigarette per day causes an additional 15 grams of tar to your lungs over 10 years. So basically 365 more cigarettes per year times 10 years, um, that, I guess, 3,650 more cigarettes causes an additional 15 grams of tars, tar, grams of tars, grams of tar. Then we can also find that an additional 15 grams of tar in your lungs increases your chance of getting cancer by 2% over your lifetime. So we can put that together, those two sort of separate lines of evidence together to essentially say that inc or increasing your smoking by an additional cigarette per day will increase your chance of getting cancer by 2%. And this is mediated by that variable of tar in the lungs. Um, 
So that's the front door method. It sounds really great, sounds really easy, but it's not used very often because it requires that there be some variable like this variable of tar in your lungs uh, in your causal diagram. Um, so this variable must exist entirely between your treatment and your outcome. It must be not linked to anything else, and it must capture a large portion of the reason why treatment affects outcome. Um, that's a lot to ask of a variable, and it turns out that that doesn't actually seem to exist in the real world all that often. So while the front door method is very useful, um, the situations in which it's applicable are maybe not as uh, widely available as we would like. And that was the end of the chapter. Um, did anybody have any questions or sort of pain points? in the chapter, I guess, before we maybe take a scroll through the homework. Uh, no, just just a comment on that that last example, you know, e e even that one felt maybe a little unrealistic. I, I don't know if the author was acknowledging that one as well, right? Because, I mean, tar and lungs uh, could be impacted by things like secondhand smoke. And to me, that's mm -hmm. like, that's the lots of things, right? So, so the, yeah. the, the, the path that's given uh, where tar and lungs only exist between smoking and cancers seems a little a little unrealistic, and maybe that's okay. Like that's probably the most <laughs> likely issue why you'd have a lot of tar in your lungs. But um, yeah, you know, even the classic example they're given doesn't seem entirely great. So <laughs> you just wonder where there's an if there's an obvious example <laughs> where, where yeah. this works great. <laughs> Yeah, I was trying to think of, you know, examples from my sort of areas of expertise and couldn't think of any just off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think that the difficulty, right, is the example comes from the world of health science, which is biology, which is extremely messy. Um, so, yeah. I think, I think this kind of goes back a little bit to the question of justifying your assumptions with natural experiments, where I don't think you'll ever really get that sort of mediating variable that's entirely isolated from any other confounding variables, but you might be able to justify the sort of small impact of the confounding variables and then sort of still take the front door method approach. Actual examples occurs. I can't think of off the top of my head. All right, so yeah, and while while you're pulling that up, you know, I'll just speak to, to my field. You know, I've I've done some uh I work in, in insurance, uh specifically health insurance. And usually, you know, I, I might benchmark two populations there, try to understand if a certain like hospital or provider system is overtreating relative to another. And um, you know, typically what we do is we we, we employ matching and we assume if you have, you know, a, a good collection of demographic variables, diagnosis information for the different populations, that's, you're, you're kind of getting, getting to your answer there. But uh, this finding front doors method is, is, is kind of foreign to, to me. Um, it feels like a lot of economics is based on that idea though. Um, yeah. Yeah. As opposed to what I've seen in the wild. All right, so let's uh, let's just kind of give a quick scroll through the homework. Um, which of the following describes when randomization of treatment occurs without a researcher controlling the randomization? It should be easy. I'll take the easy one. 
That would be a natural experiment. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about um, yeah. actually, I'm sort of interested. Did anybody catch the bonus fifth difference described in the chapter having to do with sample size and representativeness for the uh, the four major or the major differences between randomized experiments and natural experiments? I don't know if I did. Uh, I mean, you spoke to the fact that uh, populations tend to act more naturally, right? Because it, it's it's not like they're part of a known experiment. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't recall at the top of my head. Yeah, basically, um you usually get larger sample sizes in natural experiments. Um, and then in terms of representativeness, uh, I think you can, I mean. I think not, that can be a problem in natural experiments, it, uh, it right? Can, it can be a problem in randomized experiments as, or controlled experiments as well. So it's interesting because I, I think I think it can be problematic in both, but I think it is sort of problematic in different ways in the two examples, if that makes sense. Well, I'm, I'm thinking about like the charter school example and, uh, you know, I'm reading this, this other book that actually goes into detail about that specific situation. And there's kind of a lottery situation and, uh, um, it, you know, what you're really measuring is the impact on folks that would only go to the charter school if they won the lottery. But there are also folks that won't go to the charter school even if they win the lottery. Mm -hmm. um, and there are folks that don't win the lottery but still find a way to, to get to the charter school. Yeah. And, and so you're really only measuring that subset of the population that 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 will will go if they win the lottery but won't go if they don't. <laughs> and those are called compliers. And so that that's kind of a representative issue. And I think we, we kind of talk about some of this next week. I just kind of previewed it a little bit. Like that's called local average treatment effect. Um, so you might not be capturing the larger population that, that you're really, really interested in there. Yeah. Um, and that, that came into play with that lottery example too, right? I mean, you're, you're really, your larger question probably has nothing to do with the lottery itself, I don't, right. It's probably just about like income or, you know, wealth, um, in bankruptcy, but you know, you have to <laughs> deal with what, what you're provided there. And, you know, the lottery is just one mechanism where you get kind of a natural experiment going on, but it's still a subset of the population. Absolutely. Um, I mean, you also get this with the, the experiment or the, the, randomized or controlled experiments as well because um or at least in in human studies because you need to recruit volunteers so you're getting um you're getting a, a subset of the population that will choose to volunteer for things a subset of people who are likely to follow up in um in a study that requires any sort of longitudinal data um famously in psychology you know you're getting mo mostly college students so you're really only measuring the psychology of college students um yep so i think you definitely get similar issues in in both natural experiments and the controlled experiments but the specific issues or the specific ways in which you're sort of subsampling your larger sample of interest are gonna be different depending on how your study breaks down. Yeah, you certainly have a, a generalization issue, um, yeah. right? If you're, if you're only 
dealing with university students. And, you know, and this you know like I, I understand that in a lot of historically speaking, I don't know if this is true today, but like in a lot of medical studies, clinical research, you know, um, females have been underrepresented. Yeah, I was actually just going to bring up that that exact example. Um, and this is like even a problem in animal studies where theoretically you don't have to deal with that sort of self that sort of selection bias or self selection bias of people. Um, a lot of uh, medical studies that are taken undertaken on like rats and mice um, would only use male mice. Um, they also would uh there's a bunch of like weird stuff and and this is has ended up like impacting our understanding of things like fear where like it turns out that like some of the responses to like researchers is different among well i think different among male and female like rodent like lab rodents but also their responses are different depending on whether the researcher is male or female. So like secret confounding variables abound kind yeah. of thing. Wow. Um, I think an interesting thing to wrap up on on our last um, uh, our last sort of little bit, unless people want to break early, is to maybe think of some of these examples of research questions that are um, question four, we hear, here we have research questions that are causal in nature, but cannot be feasibly answered by a randomized experiment. I gave the example of paleontology in the discussion, so we can think about some of those. Um, yeah, maybe we should just wrap up on, on some of that. So, like, what sort of examples... I guess from each of your own areas of research would fit this sort of um, inability to randomize experiment. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I this is not you know for my field, but we were talking about medical research, right? And there's like ethical dilemma. Mm -hmm. with with performing research on humans I, I, they, for whatever reason we've we've come to believe it's okay to, to do the research on uh other mammals <laughs> yeah and there's issues there with um you know whether they're whether other mammals are represented even even primates um mm -hmm. are representative of enough of humans to make some of these sort of this medical research actually applicable um so yeah that's an interesting one sarah i think i saw you unmuted uh yeah so there's a whole discussion in econ because there are some experiments being done in kenya on like unconditional income because if you have u.s money then you can do that in kenya but not necessarily in the u.s but there's a huge discussion about whether that is ethical. Mm. Um, so like it is being done, but not so many people are happy about it. And then there was another paper that got a lot of discussion, let's put it that way, where on Twitter, very famous scientists, they promoted a job market paper. So basically the paper that people use to try and get a postdoc position or a professorship. Um, and that was randomized. So basically they randomized this process uh, or they randomized a lot of, yeah, a, a bonus to to get the position that you're probably going to hold for the next 30 or 40 years. Um, so there's also a lot of discussion on whether that was ethical. Interesting. Um, yeah. But then just generally, like uh, I do some research on voting and you can't really like you can't really assign a party to <laughs> or like stuff like that. It's just not possible. Yeah, um, you, or you can't yeah, assign people to live in a country and then in one country you do this policy and in the other you don't. Like, mm -hmm. just can't do that. Yeah, I can't imagine. Imagine being told like, no, you're going to vote for this party. Everybody be like, no. And you, you'd have people too who are like, even though... <laughs> 
they like actually agree with that party. They just don't like being told what to do. <laughs> They'd be like, no, I'm not. That'd be great research on fires, though. One of the other examples I was thinking about from from my own area of research is I work on a lot of animals that are long lived. Um, so you know, in the context of like a master's or PhD study, I can't like raise a bunch of wolves from puppyhood because like, I don't know, just funding. I don't have the funding to do a long-term study like that. Um, so we have to rely on natural experiments there. Is there research being done on that though? And there, <laughs> there are some long-term studies. Uh, there's a, there's one really fun, um, long-term experiment in I think in Russia where they've been like keeping a a group of foxes and have been raising them oh, yeah, they're, like, they're domesticating them they're, right? yeah, like a long-term domestication experiment I haven't kept super up to date on it though there was like some there were some papers that came out a couple years ago that were like caught and calling into question some of the methods so yeah, so like these long-term studies do exist, but um, even then they're not really like long-term randomized studies. They're just like slightly more controlled natural experiments, if that makes sense. Like I, I haven't, I can't think of a long-term study on a more long-lived mammal that that actually is like randomized controlled experiments. Not for like large mammals. There's probably some in like maybe some primates. I don't know. I think a lot of that goes back to some of the ethical questions too. Like when you have an animal that lives so long part, I think part of the, you know, part of the, uh, the ethics of using like mice and rats is that, you know, they, they have relatively short lifespans. You do experiments with them and then they get euthanized. Um, but if you wanted to do a long-term study, especially if you're doing something that might be, um, might potentially impact their quality of life significantly. Like, I don't know if you'd get ethics approval for that. Oh yeah. I'm thinking about your earlier comment about, you know, the difficulty for doing these long-term studies uh, because of funding or, or whatever. And I think that that rings true to me too. Um, I think about, you know, a lot of insurance in the U.S. is is um, obtained through em employers, whether that's health insurance, dental, vision. Um, and there's an idea out there that maybe coverage should be much richer than it is today particularly on, on the medical side for, for medical insurance, because that's going to drive down long-term costs, right? Whereas there's a barrier to care if you have very lean coverage. So folks only go when they have a really serious uh, emergency, right? They go to the emergency room only. Um, but, but, you know, these for, for conditions that potentially could have um, been managed uh, up front when, when things were milder and, um, the problem with that, of course, uh, you know, I, again, I, I work for insurers, like you could uh, essentially random, randomly assign richer coverage maybe and not, and not charge a higher premium or something like that. But, you know, it, it's problematic because there's a survivorship bias issue where folks just change employers, they they they, they drop coverage, you know, all, all this stuff kind of happens. So it's, it's really hard to, um, it's almost impossible to do that in a, in a random way uh way and, and get you know a, a good signal from it yeah and i imagine that's even harder now because my my understanding and i could i could be wrong but my understanding is that uh like overall the the amount of years that people stay in in the same position is, is generally decreasing right. on average right so yep yeah, there was one really big random 
kind of insurance experiment called the Rand uh, study, I think in the seventies. And um, I think that was incredibly expensive. And, and even that I think was pretty short lived, maybe over, you know, a handful of years or something like that. And kind of randomly assigning um, insurance richness, if you will. Right. So, so some folks had, had more or less. And, um, and I just, I think studies like that are really hard, hard to do uh, again, uh, getting the volunteers, getting the funding for that. Um, you know, there's a, there's a reason why that's cited and you don't see like a, a, a more modern version of that. All right, so we've got four minutes left. I don't know if anybody has any wrap up comments. Um, I think John is assigned to next week. I just Great. picked up 11, chapter 11. And then, you know, this is going to be interesting. We don't have to decide this now, but 12 isn't really much of a chapter. <laughs> it's like. Mm -hmm. A couple sections you could probably address it in like a couple minutes and then regression is really long so i don't know if we'll maybe give some thought to that maybe breaking up regression into a couple yeah. sessions yeah let's maybe do that i signed up for regression but i mean i could try to do it and then just break it over a couple or like at least two two talks yeah it, it feels like that might be a, a good approach because it, it, again, it is so long. Yeah. I'll would it be up for both? Okay. Thanks, Sarah. Sure. And I think we're going to have that problem maybe with some other, once we get into the technical stuff, like mm -hmm. even matching looks really long. And, um, you know, I've been exposed to some of this stuff before, but not all of it. And, you know, that's, yeah, it, it may make sense to break that up over for a couple of weeks. So, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see how it goes. I think uh, the regression chapter will be a good case study and how we want to address this stuff going forward. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I remember noting that regression was really long. Um, so yeah, I wonder if maybe we want to maybe do a little bit of a discussion in Slack, especially because John's not here today, just to see if everybody, if maybe if people are okay with us starting regression, um, on the 25th, 25th, yeah. I think whenever we're slated to do chapter 12, we should do 13. We should start 13. Yeah, that's that's what I meant. Yeah, um, yeah. okay. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. Because um, that's really just like, hey, this is a prelude to do all this <laughs> other stuff. And, you know, how long does that take to, to, to say? I mean, we could, we could probably just do it right now if we wanted to, right? So... <laughs> in the, in yeah. two minutes so yeah let's let's plan on we, let's let's put that out i think that's a good good idea ashley maybe we just put it out there on the on slack yeah, just so people know especially if people are wanting to tune in at the beginning of the sort of technical stuff um it'll be useful for them to know that we're going to start a regression that week um right. we're we're all all uh, covered for the month of September, at least. So that's good. Excellent. All right, I'll type end.